Imagine you're on a mission to Mars. You've been in your spacecraft for several months at this point. You've just entered Martian orbit and initiated your land procedure. That is, the lander of the spacecraft starts coming down towards the red planet. Slowly but surely, surely it hits the surface. You and your crewmates huddle together, gear up, and open the hatch. As you climb down the ladder and place your foot into the red dust, humans have made it to Mars. Missions like this, crewed long duration missions to different planets, are absolutely on our horizon and likely to happen within my lifetime. The last time we had such a big push towards sending people to space like this was all the way back in the 1960s. That was when the space race between what was then the Soviet Union and the United States was happening. It culminated in NASA sending people all the way to the moon and back. A key difference this time, however, is that it isn't just for men and it isn't just for Americans and Russians either. Since then, space exploration has come a long way. Mir is a space station that was initially pioneered by the Soviet Union, but was actually the product of collaboration between both the Soviets and the Americans. Notably, it was launched in the late 1980s, which was when the Cold War between those two countries was still going on. Its successor, the International Space Station, is a product of collaboration of over 15 different nations. Missions to Mars are going to be much harder than anything we've done before. As such, I have no doubt that we will see even greater collaboration in achieving those as we have seen before. In addition to all the national space agencies that are likely to work towards such a mission, we are also likely to see input from private companies. So on the topic of private companies in the aerospace industry, you may have heard about a certain SpaceX launch which happened earlier this year. This launch is of particular interest because it marks the first time in history that a private company has taken people from Earth to the International Space Station. It's also, interestingly enough, the first time in almost a decade that the United States has had its own launch vehicle and that astronauts have been launched from anywhere on US soil. Between 2011, which was the last space shuttle launch, and this year, all transit between the Earth and outer space, sorry, the Earth and space, was on board the Russian Soyuz. What I'm getting at here is that with missions back to the moon and all the way to Mars on our horizon, and a lot of new players entering this space, whether that be countries like Australia, which just founded their own space agency, or private companies that are now gaining a lot of momentum, we are likely to see an explosion in the amount of opportunities and jobs within the aerospace industry, and specifically within humans in aerospace. This is of particular importance because we are about to enter a period where we are going to be developing what I call legacy systems. These are systems like spacecraft that might be used by future generations. And it's extremely important that we take this opportunity to develop these systems to suit a very wide range of people. And here is why that is so important. It may surprise you to know that women are 47% more likely to become seriously injured if they are involved in a car accident. And over 70%, that is 70%, more likely to die if they're involved in an accident than men are. One of the reasons that is speculated for this is because way back in the mid 20th century, when legacy systems for car safety were being developed, the vast majority of people in the automotive industry were men. Somewhat understandably, these men designed safety test procedures and crash test dummies around people that looked like them. As you can see, when this happens, you can have pretty adverse discrepancies in the efficacy of these systems when you don't think about people that might not be represented in the room. As Daphna mentioned, I'm a grad researcher in the Bioastronautics Laboratory, and I'm going to use one of the projects we are working on to illustrate what this looks like today. This particular project seeks to use white noise as a means of astronaut performance enhancement. We hope to take advantage of something called stochastic resonance to do this. Stochastic resonance refers to a somewhat counterintuitive phenomena whereby the addition of the right amount of white noise to a faint signal actually makes that signal clearer. So way over on the left, we have a picture of Big Ben. It's very easy to make out. 
one image to the right, there is a very faint version of it. That is our faint signal. And I promise you, the only thing that is being added to that faint signal as we move over to the right is white noise. Yet somewhere around images three or four, it once again becomes extremely easy to make out that original image of Big Ben. This kind of addition of the right amount of white noise is what we are going to be using to hopefully make people slightly better at perception. The type of white noise we are using is vestibular white noise. Your vestibular system refers to your inner ear organs, and they're what give you your sense of balance. They're what tell you, oh, I'm leaning forward, I am tilting to the left, and help keep you upright. We are using this device here to electronically stimulate places behind your ears and to essentially artificially add noise to the vestibular system. So by placing electrodes in just the right position behind your ears and running a current through them, we are able to artificially add white noise on top of the signal that is coming out of your vestibular system. Thus far, somewhat counterintuitively, we've been able to show that white noise, when added in this fashion, actually makes people slightly better at visual perception. That's pretty crazy. However, a big caveat to our results thus far is that given our location on a college campus, the vast majority of the people that we have tested this technology on are under the age of 25. This is quite problematic because NASA, who is sponsoring this project, is interested in having this technology applied to astronauts. There are very, very few astronauts under the age of 25. As a result of this, the research team is now working very hard to recruit subjects that are between the ages of 30 and 55 and from a broad range of gender identities and backgrounds because this is better representative of the population of astronauts that we wish to know if this technology is useful for. One of the reasons that I believe my research group is so good about this and pays so much attention to ensuring that the subject pool matches up to the population at large is because I'm very proud to say that I believe my research group is very diverse. We look very different from each other, we sound very different from each other. In fact, my research group is about 50-50 men and women, all the way from our undergrads on this project to our grad students, to the two professors. And what's more is that my experience here with regards to how diverse the group is, is not that unique. While I was at MIT, I had the opportunity to do research in the Laboratory for Atomistic and Molecular Mechanics, where I looked at 3D printing artificial bone. While I was there, I was very lucky and had the opportunity to contribute to a scientific publication with several other people in the lab. What's interesting about that publication is that more than half of the authors on it are female-identified people of color. So what I'm getting at here is that Diversity in research across this nation is very important, and also it is so, so different from how it used to be already. The final thing that I want to draw in is that aerospace, specifically looking at human spaceflight, requires not just a diversity of people, but also a diversity of academic backgrounds. Some people might think of aerospace as this one subject that you do at school, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Aerospace, I believe, is much better described as this amalgamation of many different academic expertise and areas and backgrounds for the common goal of building aerospace systems. So although I'm working towards a PhD in aerospace engineering sciences, I also have a background, an educational background, in architecture. One of the things I had to do for that education was design a chair. And yes, before you ask, <laughs> chair design and chairs have very little to do with aerospace. However, when you design a chair, it is extremely important that the chair you're designing withstands the weight of the people that are going to sit on it. It is comfortable to sit in for a prolonged period of time and can accommodate a lot of different people. Now, while the chair itself doesn't have anything to do with aerospace, this design thinking of designing your product around who is going to use it and how they're going to use it has been incredibly valuable in my experience as a PhD researcher looking to experiment with technologies around who is going to use them and why they're using them and how they're using them. Another example of this interdisciplinary nature of some topics in aerospace engineering is that white noise project I told you about gave us back data that was pretty difficult to interpret in some ways, to the point that we ended up designing, building, training, and deploying a machine learning algorithm to help us with classifying some of our data. 
machine learning is generally not considered a pillar of aerospace engineering and is generally not something that you're likely to come across in an aerospace engineering education. In this situation, we had to take some knowledge from a completely different area and apply it to our specific use case in aerospace to ultimately better do our research. So once again, to bring this all together, I believe that we are about to enter a very high growth period within the aerospace in industry, where we are likely to, to be designing legacy systems. And it is so, so important that we have a lot of different people working together on this. So with that, how can you get involved if, something, if this is something that you are interested in? The two common themes I see among my peers working in aerospace are the privilege of an education and a passionate desire to be there. My peers have educational backgrounds ranging from communications to neuroscience to mathematics and physics. The common theme, though, is that all these people were genuinely interested in what they were studying. If you are able to finish high school and are lucky enough to have access to college, I believe that a formal education in something that you are genuinely passionate about is going to be the most valuable stepping stone on the pathway to ultimately putting people in space. Now, I definitely don't want to say or claim that it's going to be easy, because it probably won't. I also don't want to say that discrimination doesn't exist anymore, because unfortunately it still does. But I do want to say that unlike in the 1960s, it no longer matters how you look or where you're from. This time, it is absolutely possible to work towards putting people in space and building spacecraft if that is what you want to do. So with that, I want to know what is unique about you, what is unique about your background and your experience, and therefore, what are you going to bring to the table of human spaceflight?